Stage B. It is my great and abiding pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Flick from the Centre for Computing and Social Responsibility at De Montfort University in the lovely United Kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, and everybody else, please welcome Catherine. No. Thank you, my dear friend here. Um, we've been friends for a long time, so it's all good. Um, hi. Uh, I have to apologize a little bit for the, uh, the state of my slides, which are a little bit quick because I've been trying to fight fires most of today, trying to get the stages actually moving. So <laughs> please apologize. I, I'm, I'm, please accept my apologies. Um, I'm basically here with two hats on. I'm a technology ethicist um, and I'm actually on the Committee of Professional Ethics for the ACM. Um, some of you may be ACM members, don't worry, I won't put, get you to put your hands up or anything. But some of you may be, know what the ACM is, it's the Association of Computing Machinery. It's the largest professional organization for computing, anyone who does anything with computing basically. So computer scientists, games designers, game art people, even like we have like, um, like financial service people, I mean it runs the whole gamut of tech. Um, and what we've done recently, oh yeah, uh, before we start, if you have questions, I probably won't be able to get to them, but what I will be able to do is look at them and then possibly write something about them later. So I have a Slido, uh, slido.com, and if you put in, so if you open up your phones and put that in and then have hash, uh, just the, the join code is EMF code, uh, and you can um, put a dilemma or a question in there, and it may get turned into a case study for the code of ethics if it's like, we'll, we'll obviously anonymize it and all that sort of thing but it may turn into a generic style case study if it's an interesting dilemma, um, or if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, or if I get time, I'll go through the best ones. Okay. Um, so the code of ethics, so like I said, um, the ACM is a really big computing organization, and um, we had a code of ethics, it was sort of a code of conduct before 1992, uh, which basically said these are things you shouldn't be doing. Uh, and then in 1992, they actually decided to sit down and write an actual code of ethics. Um, and what then happened is they said, oh, well, we'll update it frequently. And then they didn't. Um, and then the internet came along and AI came along, well, machine learning as we know it currently came along and a whole bunch of other things came along and then it got to 2018 they were like, yeah, we probably really do need to update it now. So over the last two years, I've basically been um, part of this process. I was on the steering committee for updating this code of ethics um, and it was a huge participative experience where we got loads of people to basically comment on drafts and all this sort of stuff. So it's pretty much ground up built, but based on the original code. So there are some similar things and some different and some new things. So I'm not going to expect you to have read the code. Um, what I'm going to do though uh, is take you through a few things that are, might be useful to look at if you're an ACM member. Um, if you are an ACM member, one of the conditions of your membership of the ACM is that you abide by this code. So you probably, probably really want to have a listen to this. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. You also probably got a bunch of emails from us saying, please help. Uh, so thank you if you did help us. Um, so why do we need something like this? Uh, well, it's really interesting. As a technology ethicist, I've been doing this for a really long time now. And like 10, some, 50, I don't know, a really long time, longer than I would like to think. Um, and basically, it was only about, a, up until about a year ago, I was the one knocking on people's doors saying, you need to think about ethics. About a year ago, something happened, Cambridge Analytica and a bunch of AI stuff that people got worried about, um, and I started getting all these invitations to come and talk at, um, like, particularly AI conventions, like big industry conventions, and now it just seems like the floodgates have opened. So it's really good for me, I guess. Um, I would actually really like to be out of a job at some point, uh, because then we'll have solved all these problems, but basically there seems to be a lot of call for ethics right now because people are realizing that technology can actually have some significant social harm attached to it. Um, so one of the key focuses that we really wanted to put into the new code of ethics was a focus on the fact that we should be using our skills as technology creators, software developers, etc., innovators of any kind uh, that has anything to do with tech. We should be using it for the public good and we should be using it for the social good. There's no point in making tech 
for tech's sake um, if it doesn't actually have some benefit to somebody somewhere. And then it's about then also things like, be um, like benefits, uh, looking at the benefits versus the harms, which I'll get into in a bit. But the key thing was the first sentence of the preamble we wrote, computing professionals' actions change the world. To act responsibly, they should reflect upon the wider impacts of their work, consistently supporting the public good. The ACM Code of Ethics, blah, 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 expresses the conscience of the profession. And we claim that it expresses the conscience of the profession mostly because it has been a ground up activity. Like we, we really wanted to make sure that this wasn't just a bunch of people from ivory academic towers coming down and preaching upon, preaching the words to the, you know, the people. Uh, we wanted to make sure that actually everybody was involved. We wanted to practice what we preached, right? We wanted this to actually be relevant to people uh, actually doing things in the real world. So the very first principle that we have is that a computing professional should contribute to society and to human well-being, acknowledging that all people are stakeholders in computing. So it's no longer accept acceptable if you're creating things to no like basically kind of do it in a bubble, if, especially if it's going to have some sort of social impact. You need to be out there um, making sure that you're doing it with the public good in mind and also collaborating with stakeholders, anyone who might be impacted by the technology that you're creating. So um, a couple of the major changes that happened between 1992, I mean, we had the internet showed up. Um, we had a whole bunch of uh, uh, awakenings, and I think the previous talk is a really good example of how kind of things have shifted over the past you know, 20, 30, however many years. Um, we're now like... Um, much more aware of women's role in computing, computer science, and how that's an un, like there's, there's still a, a long way to go there to, before there's kind of equal um, treatment of women in computing area. Uh, although there's a lot of work being done, which is fantastic. Um, so there's a much broader description of uh, discrimination and what that entails. So before the code didn't have anything about, say, harassment, particularly sexual harassment, that's now specifically in the code. Um, and it's basically, uh, there are also a whole lot more um, aspects of um, like discrimination that are, are covered. So we used to just have kind of like race, gender, and something else, but we now have a whole bunch of other um, other aspects that are now covered. Um, there were two big things on intellectual property rights. So it used to say basically, you must abide by intellectual property rights, which I'm sure you guys, many of you here would be hor horrified to think that that was something that we would be, that would be required to do. And me too. So I was given the uh, homework uh, as part of this thing to, to redraft the intellectual property section, which basically uh, turned into respect the work required to produce new ideas, inventions, creative works, and computing artifacts, which now basically puts the emphasis on respecting the decisions that creators make um, within reason. And there are basically, if, if it's ethically justifiable to break these things, you've got an out in there as well. So there's, there's, a, there's a way to get around that now. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, uh, design and implement systems that are robustly and usably secure. Back in 1992, there was very little security apart from physical security. So now we are requiring security by design, which is something that most people hopefully do anyway, um, but it's something that you now actually are required to do by the Code of Ethics. Uh, 3.6, use care when modifying or retiring systems. This was certainly not on anyone's radar back in 1992, but things like Microsoft retiring certain operating systems and various other large-scale things, Google Reader comes to mind as one that really annoyed me. Basically, if people are using your software, you have to have a really good reason to retire it. And you then also need to help shepherd them onto something that will um, like basically replace the thing that you're um, retiring. Um, 3.7, recognize and take special care of systems that become integrated into the infrastructure of society. Facebook, right? If you're Twitter, Facebook, anything, if you're creating something that then goes on to become not just that thing you did in your garage or with a couple of your mates, but becomes like a massive infrastructure thing, you need to be really careful about how you handle that. And there's some guidance in the code of ethics that helps you to do that now. So. How do I actually use this practically? Um, well, the idea is basically, uh, it's supposed to be a, a way for you to reflect on what it is that you're doing. It's not a step, you know, a how-to 
do things ethically. Um, there is no one-size-fits-all rule for any of this stuff. Ethics is not a set of rules. It's a way of getting you to think about what it is that you're doing. There are no easy way outs in ethics. You need to actually sit down and think about it. Um, so I'm going to take, take through a few examples of some things. So this is slightly adapted from a video games uh, conference that I went to recently, but I've, I've tried to kind of adapt it to a bit, be a bit more general. Um, so I'm going to take you through just a couple of ways of how you might think through these issues. Um, so if you're creating technology for vulnerable people, so children, old people, uh, anyone with various disabilities that might be make them be considered vulnerable. Um, there are a whole bunch of things that you can think about that the, the code will help you think through. For example, there's a whole section on avoidance of harm and what it is about what exactly is harm and how you can um, like, you know, make sure that the, the technology that you create doesn't in, inflict this on people. I'm going to get, there's a little bit of a complication to the harm thing which I'm going to get to in a bit. Um, obviously, if you need to be honest and trustworthy, particularly with, with vulnerable people, um, and this is because they don't often, uh, sometimes there are reasons why they're not able to make very good decisions for themselves. So I've got the picture up here of revenue generated by premiums children, premium children's games in the mobile game industry, um, because basically that's one area where children are not able to consent to, say, pay money for games necessarily, and it gets very, very you need to think about that when you're developing it. Um, Fostering public awareness and understanding of computing, related technologies and their consequences, principle 2.7. Basically what this asks you to do is make sure that people can understand what it is that you're creating. And yes, for the machine learning people out there, I know this is complicated, but you need to have a go. <laughs> um, and if you have actually struggle with that, I do a lot of that sort of thing. So if you want to come and talk to me at some point this weekend, I'm more than happy to help you uh, explain you know, I can, I can explain Bitcoin in 15 seconds for the local radio station, so I, I'm quite good at simplifying things. Um, 2.9, design and implement systems that are robustly and usably secure, basically security by design. You've got to protect people. You can't just throw stuff out there now that's not got actually security by design in it. Um, another one, data analytics. So basically discrimination obviously is a huge, uh, people are worried about bias of algorithms. Uh, the fact that a lot of the data that is put into the training for these systems is biased to start with. How do you remove bias? This is an ongoing question that machine learning people need to think about, particularly, um, and data, data analytics people need to think about. And it's not that I'm, there's a solution in the code, but it basically says you need to think about this and you have to have really good reasons behind the decisions that you make about what you include and what you exclude and how you anonymize and all that sort of thing. Um, respect privacy hopefully is self-evident. Um, honor confidentiality. This, ha can ha this is an issue about basically if you've if you're, um, got confidential information, you need to be careful with how you treat that. And that just kind of goes into data analytics. So some of the information you might be dealing with might be confidential. Um, high quality in the processes and products of professional work. This basically has a section in it that basically says if you don't understand what your anal analytics is doing, if you don't understand how your machine learning algorithm is making decisions, then maybe that's not something you should like. like. I know this is a really complicated area, so I don't want to oversimplify it, but you need to really think about what it is that you're actually doing with that algorithm and how it, how it might work and what information actually might be those key kind of um, things that, that, that uh, then used for decision making. Um, and that's part of the quality in testing. And I've got a, a picture of Taybot, which some of you might remember, uh, who was basically thrown out on the internet and became very much like a horrible person very quickly. And basically, um, this principle would say that you need to test, you need to test things better. <laughs> and if you don't, do and if you're not able to test them sufficiently beforehand, you need to monitor them. Uh, while they're out in the wild doing their thing and pull it back if it's doing terrible things quickly. Um, oh, my laptop's just turned off. Uh, knowing respect existing rules pertaining to professional work. Stay in the law where you can. There are exceptions for if the laws, so we've got a lot of exceptions for basically, we're worried about um, kind of fascist regimes and things like that where, uh, and this is actually something that in 1992 they weren't so worried about, but we are now. and. Um, <laughs> So there are basically, if, there, if the rules are unethical, there are ways of challenging the rules and there's some guidance in the code for you to do that. And basically, like I said before, this should all be done with the public good as the central concern.
I'm going to skip over diversity. Hopefully, I, I mean, I, it's mostly just for time because I want to get through the rest of this stuff. But you see what I'm kind of doing. I'm using aspects of the code get to basically um, get questions up in your heads about perhaps what it is that you're doing to challenge what it is that you do. And some of that might be uncomfortable, and that's totally fine. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can ignore it. Uh, it means that that needs to be something that you need to start thinking about, integrating into how you do your work, uh, that sort of reflection, that reflection time. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a sec. So some frequently asked questions we get at the Code Central, uh, <laughs> uh, which is ethics.acm.org. Uh, what if my boss thinks codes of ethics are for losers? So basically, what if like your boss asks you to do something that is against the code of ethics? Um, if you're an ACM member, you can actually hold this up and wave it at them. Um, and then if they uh, sort of say, well, screw you, you can, there are actually ways of going through whistleblowing and stuff. And the ACM is, um, it, we have to be very careful about how we uh, promote that aspect of the code because although it's been used for like legal decisions and things in the States, uh, it's actually very difficult, like obviously for an organization to help support people all around the world. Um, but we're able to give people guidance, but ultimately, unfortunately, when it comes down to it, the, the rules of the land are the rules of the land. You have to understand that you might be breaking those in some ways, right? Um, uh, yeah, so another question we get is, what if I'm in the military or security? Does that mean that the code of ethics isn't for me because I'm obviously going to be harming people and that might not be, the, the, the public good may not be the center of my concern? Um, and basically, we have been very careful to word the code so that if you are in the security or military domains and you do do things that might be considered slightly eh, um, that there are ways of thinking through the code that actually can keep you in, in this process. Um, so for example, in the harm, the, the avoid harm, we change that so many times. You hear about do no harm, right? And that's kind of like the Hippocratic Oath. We don't say that specifically. Uh, and that's because it's about um, justifiable, ethically justifiable harm. And sometimes when you're in security, there may be some ethically justifiable um, attacks you might need to make against a system or something like that that might be um, considered otherwise against the code of ethics. Why didn't I plug this thing in? Um, but, um, or if you're in like, weapons development or something like that, there might be times where you, like, you, your efforts might be um, better spent sort of working on how to make it so that other people aren't harmed by the specific weapon. I mean, these are all things we had to think about and it's really, really complicated and not we're never going to please everybody, although I really, I mean, I'm a pacifist, so this stuff is really uncomfortable for me to talk about, but I can kind of see the point that um, uh, basically we want to keep people in, in thinking about this. We don't want people to, like people in these sectors particularly just to say, oh, well, this isn't for me. Um, basically, I, like, as far as I'm concerned, if the code gets them thinking about this sort of thing and then thinking, well, actually, maybe military or um, you know, bad security isn't actually for me, then that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, but you know, there are kind of, they, they, these very fine lines are very difficult to work, walk along, I have to say. Come and see me after, at the bar after I've had a few drinks and I'll tell you more. Um, how, how is this code different from other codes? So some of you may know the IEEE Software Engineering Code. Um, it's different because it's, firstly, it's newer uh, and also it's um, a much more general and it's an aspirational code. So the software engineering code is much more a list of don'ts, um, but the uh, ACM code is very much aimed at students to kind of inspire them to do things well as opposed to, you know, slapping them on the wrist if they don't do it. Um, but speaking of that, what if I break the code? Uh, if, you're an a if you're not an ACM member, nothing, unless you break the law, in which case that's a different thing. Uh, if you are an ACM member, we can discipline you, which sounds scarier than it is. Um, but also we have, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Um, also, uh, basically, uh, the committee, it's very complicated, but we have a much better system now. If someone, or if you think someone has broken the code of ethics that might be an ACM member, um, there are, um, the, co the Committee on Professional Ethics will actually take it on as a case and then we kind of deal with it. Um, and there are a basically a range of, um, disciplinary actions that we can take, including stopping you from coming to our conferences, and that's probably about the worst one you'd get from the ACM, unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, um, yeah, 
Um, so that's basically, yeah, if you break the code and you're an ACM member, that's not good. All right, so previously I talked about integration of this sort of stuff into your ways of working. So how can you actually do this practically? Well, there's another um, uh, thing that we do in Europe <laughs> called responsible innovation. And this is actually my other hat, my academic hat is now on. Um, responsible innovation is basically the idea of creating technology with and for society. And the this is ethically aligned. The idea is to get people thinking about ethics and getting them to integrate it into the ways that they work uh, with the innovations that they, they make. So this area framework is um, the one that we mostly use in the UK uh, and in parts of Europe as well. But basically, it's about getting you to asking you to anticipate what the potential impacts of um, your in, of your technology or your innovation might be on society, reflecting on the ethical and social issues that that might raise. So you can use the code for that. That's a really good place to use the code of ethics. Engaging with relevant stakeholders to help them to help identify potential issues and mitigate those, and not just in the testing stage, but the very beginning of the um, innovation cycle. Um, and then act by putting methods in place to ensure issues are resolved. So this is like having good HR policies and processes, having good testing, QA, that sort of thing. It's about basically codifying a lot of the good practice you probably do already into methods that you follow every single time. Uh, and hopefully those are responsible ones. So um, benefits to behaving ethically. Um, oh, this is left over from my video games talk, which is great. I'll leave that one there. Um, so we've been doing some work with companies. I've been working with cybersecurity companies in the UK for the last two years now, getting them thinking about responsible innovation and ethics in what they do. Um, and they've uh, talked to me about what they feel is the, uh, the other benefits that they've been getting from this. Um, basically, it's all about trust. Um, they have better reception from the public, so they have better a better reputation, which builds trust. They have employee satisfaction, which builds trust within the employees that they have because pe people like to work for ethical companies. Uh, they have better quality innovations uh, because people are stimulated to work and do things better. Uh, and you get a wider audience than just nerd bros, um, which, sorry for all the nerd bros out there, but you are actually a minority. Uh, and there's a much broader audience out there for all sorts of technology uh, than just the power users. Um, sorry, I'm not equating power users to nerd bros, so they're different, D not doing that. Um, and you're doing the right thing, so you can sleep at night, so that's nice as well. <laughs> um, so more on ethics and technology. Um, basically, there's a bunch of links here. Um, if you just Google ACM Code of Ethics, you can find the ACM Code of Ethics. Um, Tia and I do a podcast on video games and ethics, if you're interested in that. Um, Tia's been doing a fabulous job here in stage B all day, so thank you. Um, and also there's, a, there's that responsible innovation stuff that I talked about um, is available at Orbit RRI, um, which is the main center for the UK's responsible innovation um, information stuff. And you can find me on Twitter, and the ACM ethics stuff is on Twitter, and we've done Reddit stuff. And, I mean, we're trying to really get the word out. And if you'd like a sticker that has ACM ethics, like that one, um, come down to the green room and I will give you one because I was stupid and forgot to bring them up. <laughs> um, all right, so, got a dilemma. Have we got time, Tira? How much time have we got? Oh, we got some time, I think. We have time. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to refresh my Slido and see if anyone's put a dilemma. Oh, here we go. Here we go. People have said stuff. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we're at the peak of hype for tech ethics. When we get out of this phase and it's less hip again, what is the biggest thing that will have changed in the world? Ooh. I think actually what will probably happen is that um, tech companies will have much broader stakeholder work. Like they, they'll, they'll work much more with the general public in ways that are much more inclusive of not just people who are white middle class people who can afford to go to a one day workshop and try out a new piece of technology. It'll be ways that will include people who perhaps are of lower socioeconomic status, who can, uh, you know, don't perhaps, uh, who may only use the technology in uh, kind of emergency situations, who are much more removed from the direct usage of a technology. And I think that actually will really improve a lot of, uh, that will be the biggest thing that will have changed. I'm not quite sure if that's what you meant in terms of biggest thing that will have changed. Um, there probably will be deaths of some big technology companies in some ways, but 
Anyway, oh yeah, I wanted to mention how Google, uh, so the Google employees who are pushing back against the, the Chinese censorship recently used the new ACM code of ethics as a basis to push back to their employer. Um, and actually I wrote a, a piece in the conversation about uh, Google and, and Google in China and how the ACM code of ethics thinks that's a bad idea. And then they used that as um, like, which is really nice. <laughs> so I was quite happy about that. Um, all right. Uh, I just, anonymous asks, you're all anonymous, that's great. I just completed a computer science degree. Ethics seemed included by necessity rather than during, due to understanding its importance. What can we do to change this attitude? Uh, employ ethicists to teach the ethics courses, <laughs> not just people who, um, like often in computer science departments, it's left to someone that has like spare time and or maybe uh, like they've mentioned that they were interested in ethics once and now they're kind of lumped with all this teaching that isn't computer science. I know certainly in some departments that ethics is considered because you need it to get BCS accredited in the UK, right? So the British Computing Society requires you to have a certain amount of ethics in your degree program uh, if you want to get accredited by them. Uh, and certainly I've known uh, certain departments, which I will not name, that uh, basically see it as um, something that is taking away from teaching students tech and that that's a bad thing and so it has a negative like lump that comes along with it even at the, the top level. So it's, it's about changing attitudes. Like with the cybersecurity companies I've been working with, the only way you can get uh, companies to take on kind of an ethical culture is to change the uh, minds of the people at the top Otherwise, it really doesn't, nothing, I mean, unless you've got a really big workforce and they're all aligned with being ethical, which rarely happens, um, you're, you're going to, it's difficult to push back against a CEO or a department head that doesn't want to do this sort of thing. Um, good, they're coming in quick and fast. Do let me know when I'm out of time, Tia. Um, <laughs> Two minutes, okay. What should Facebook do to act responsibly about their role in society, specifically in relation to political advertising data they have internally? Well, specifically with, in relation to that, they should probably delete it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I mean, I think they have, they're really doing a lot of soul searching at the moment, uh, which is a good thing. Um, I still wouldn't have a Facebook account. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wrote about that too. I wrote a thing about informed consent on that, and that was very interesting. Um, Anyway, um, uh, what should they do? So, what Facebook didn't do, let's just say. So let's let's let's, let's talk about what Facebook didn't do. What they didn't do is they didn't um, establish a, a method for reliably communicating consent aspects uh, when it came to the data that they were collecting. So they weren't very good at communicating what data they were going to collect and how they were going to use it. And they also didn't do a very good job of um, managing the um, kind of fall, like, basically they did, did a very poor job of managing the kind of political aspect of that. So actually there's a really good um, radio lab, if anyone listens to the radio lab podcast on Facebook and how they do a lot of their content moderation, for example, and the fact is they have all these rules about what can and can't be on Facebook and they're just like, you, the problem with ethics, like I said before, is it's not a how-to. You can't step through and say step one, do this; step two, do that. The same thing is when you come, when you have a whole lot of context, and you have to then make decisions about do we allow this on our platform or do we not allow this on our platform. It usually comes with a lot of context, and when you're a worldwide company, you have a lot of worldwide context, and it gets really, really complicated because in China you can say things that you can't, you can't, well, you can't say things that you can say in the UK or America or the Netherlands or, or where it is, and, and, and everything gets very, very complicated. And I think they really did that very poorly. Um, and I mean, in some ways it was kind of inevitable, um, but the way that they can solve this problem now is probably, to be honest, to really kind of scale back their operations, uh, certainly on the um, political side, um, really focus on kind of going back to what it is that they actually wanted to do, which was to be a way for people to communicate with their friends and family. But then also, and this is sort of walking a fine line, just be very careful about what sorts of content that uh, those sorts of communications actually have. But that's, that needs to be something that's agreed with the community as well. Like they need to build it up with certain groups and oh, it gets very, very complicated. Come see me in the bar, that would be a good one. One more or are we good? 
One more. All right. Laws are very slow to change and adapt. This is a really good, good one. Laws are very slow to change and adapt compared to evolving technology. What can we do in the meantime to counter the groups unwilling to follow the code? So, I mean, this is a cl classic more uh, policy vacuum. Um, and this is something that technology is just, we've, we've all, like, this is going back, generate, like, many, many, many years we've been dealing with this. Um, what we can do is we can do things, we can be good examples, um, we can show the benefits of doing things ethically. So these cybersecurity companies, um, for example, who've been doing this, um, you know, th like, they are now being, like, they're sort of being held up as kind of pinnacles of, good tech um, and we can also um, you know vote with our you know with our wallets right so don't get a Facebook account um, you know don't sign up to the latest thing just because it's there actually have a look at what it is and what they want to do and also educate your friends and family that may not be as tech savvy as you are that's certainly a big thing that you can do help them make informed decisions because at the moment they're not able to really do that because they're not being informed very well okay thank you very much I can do more of these in the bar afterwards. Well, actually, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to MC the next talk, so.